Welcome once again uh, to Foundations of Christian Thought and uh, just want to pick up kind of where we left off on uh, the week five lecture and I hope if you're following these uh, in direct line with the week of each course, uh, the week corresponding with the date of our course, uh, you should be uh, viewing this uh, right after Thanksgiving. And so I trust that you had a, a good Thanksgiving weekend. And um, as we move forward, want to kind of pick up on the idea of last time we talked about, um, you know, our being saved by faith and all the different aspects and, and especially of adoption, being brought into the family uh, of God, being a co-heir with Christ. And as a result of that, we are part of what the New Testament would call um, the church. And uh, so just want to walk through uh, some of the aspects of the church as it's presented to you in your reading and uh, as we move forward in our time together in the course. So let's look at the marks of a true church. And um, we need to understand that a true church will contain the elements prescribed and portrayed in the New Testament. The, the, the church was the body, or is, as the New Testament calls it, the body of Christ. And it's that uh, which is made up of uh, those who are saved, those who are believers, those who are followers um, of Christ. And so as we look at these, we want to be careful to, uh, as always, use Scripture as our guide. And so... Uh, this uh, this aspect of church taken from the scripture and then looking at some of the elements in regards to um, the church itself or the marks of a true church as Horton calls it and it's uh, in, in your reading Horton describes the true church as being identified with um, the, the sacraments and the two requirements for the sacraments in other words the two things that that the New Testament would list as qualifications for them being sacraments are number one that they are instituted by christ and number two that they are um, uh, evangelical in substance and i think that's an important thing for us to remember that uh, as we partake of these sacraments as we practice these aspects of what um, has been instituted in the new testament that we are careful to understand them not only for um, what they reveal in a in a in a pictorial sense but um, also how they uh, impact us and uh, how they uh, unite us or draw us together as the uh, historic orthodox christian church now um, there are uh, there are other groups that would list um, other practices as sacraments, uh, but the idea that they are instituted by Christ and uh, evangelical in substance are are going to be our guidelines as we look at these um, together. So that's a that's a key element um, because, as Horton points out, the Scripture identifies the sacra the sacraments as signs and seals of the covenant, and so. Uh, the meaning of this is in the sense that these sacrifices, um, as we said, were those instituted by Christ. Christ was baptized, um, and as he told John the Baptist, it was to fulfill all righteousness. Now, uh, we see later in the New Testament that our baptism, or a baptism of those who who uh, become believers in Christ, um, are a sign of uh, the regeneration or the repentance uh, or the change that's been made, but Christ was baptized, and then in the closing of the Gospels, uh, directs his followers to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, Christ also instituted, um, as he celebrated the last Passover, or what we would call as the Lord's Supper, um, uh, with his disciples, and and we know again through the New Testament that we are to um, continue this until he returns um, and so we see those instituted by Christ but they're also evangelical in substance in that they portray or they tie us to 
um, what Christ has accomplished um, with Romans 6 giving us a, a, a picture of being baptized uh, as being buried with Christ and raised to new life um, and then uh, with Christ himself talking about the, the bread and the cup uh, being representative uh, and as Paul uh, reminded us in 1 Corinthians 11 of the, the body and blood uh, in the new covenant. And so uh, these, as we use the term sacraments, are not um, in the same way they would be understand, understood in a general sense uh, because um, they are connected with the grace that God gives us. Um, but as some believe, um, especially the Roman Catholic Church believes that they are the conveyance of saving grace. Um, and so we have to be careful, again, to stick with Scripture and not add to that which um, the Bible does not fully teach. So um, the Roman Catholic view of what they call transubstantiation um, literally means that when they take communion or when they take the Mass, that the bread is literally and physically uh, changed into the body of Christ and that the wine actually and literally becomes um, the blood of Christ uh, when it's received properly. And, and that kind of is the uh, that kind of is the issue there because they hold that it can only be done according to the way um, they say it must be done and blessed by the priest, etc. And so um, in, in Roman Catholicism, this, this infusion by the physical act into the very soul of those who would take it, um, is, uh, it comes from a Latin term, the ex opera, operato, is, is a term that means in the doing it is done. And so they see the sacraments as the vehicles of grace, uh, which are conveyed, and that's a that's a misunderstood or misled view. It's, it doesn't line up with our understanding of the New Testament, and it replaces literally what Christ has done with the church and its official capacity or authority to be able to convey God's grace. And, and uh, we know from the New Testament, as we have spoken in times past, um, that it, God's grace is a gift, and it's given by God uh, to those who receive it through faith. And so for Orthodox Christians, there's a great significance to the Lord's Supper and baptism. And, and through these sacraments, we reveal, that's the evangelical substance, we reveal what Christ has done and what only he could do for us. And uh, with baptism, it is commanded, as we mentioned in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, um, in Peter's sermon in Acts 2, when the question of what do we do in response to Peter's preaching he instructed them to repent and be baptized. And then, as we mentioned, the picture we see in Romans chapter 6 as our connection with Christ through death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, Ephesians lists um, in regards to the church that one baptism is part of that list of the oneness, one Lord, one faith, one baptism in regards to the true church. And so baptism by definition, involves water and is administered in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as directed by Christ. And rightly ordered and carried out, um, this, along with the Word, um, are what we see as signs. And when I say the Word, I mean the Scripture. What we see as signs of the true church. Um, and so it's important, I'm sorry I didn't flip that slide earlier, um, it's important that we understand um, that which was just discussed over the previous moments um, in regards to uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So understanding that a true church is marked by the Word, the Bible, and the practices uh, accordingly regarding the sacraments. And uh, in your church, you may use a little different term, um, the term ordinance. In a, a number of evangelical churches, it takes the place of um, Horton's use of the word sacrament, and and to some degree there is a difference um, in the Reformed tradition. The difference is that these rites of baptism and the Lord's Supper are more than just symbolic. Um, many who use just the term ordinance see it as strictly a symbolic um, uh, action, 
and what the ordinance conveys. Um, but there are there is still a, a connection to what Christ has done, and and in these sacraments it connects us to what Christ has done, as well as cr connects us to um, His Church uh, in Him. And so um, I personally don't go as far as um, the view that finds the actual bread and cup becoming the physical body and blood of Christ, which we mentioned as a as a predominantly Roman Catholic view. Um, but neither is the water for baptism holy just because someone blesses it. Um, and so I see a depth beyond just strictly symbolism, which is usually tied with the word ordinance, but may not be in your particular congregation. Um, but that what Christ has done in our connection with him and with each other as part of his body. And that's important. That's an important aspect. Um, of especially taking the Lord's Supper together because of what it represents in our standing before God and practiced within the church. Um, I believe there's an element of we share in this with one another. And so we have not only um, this connection to Christ, but we have this connection to community within the believers. And uh, we know that as the Lord's Supper um, represents what Christ has done so that we can stand clean before God. So too, we take it with one another as an important uh, aspect of are we in right relationship with one another. And so um, these are clear, the, 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 the baptism, the Lord's Supper, these are clear and direct opportunities to testify to the gospel of Christ. And, um, and at every turn, um, it's always uh, more than what we will ever fully understand um, in, it, in its significance. And so um, I trust that as we participate in these um, elements of the church, um, that we wouldn't just limit it to pure symbolism, um, which is easy to become rote, um, but uh, also that we would understand it's not an action beyond what Christ has already done that would save us. And so uh, when Christ instituted the Lord's Supper, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many uh, for the forgiveness of sin. And Paul identifies this cup of blessing as a sharing in the blood of Christ um, in 1 Corinthians. And uh, the cup is identified as the new covenant in his blood and we, and we proclaim that um, just as we're told to proclaim his death until he he returns and so these are realities uh, prescribed in god's word and and practiced by the earliest of christians and through christian history to us today and so um, the presentation of this reality is again all centered in what christ has done and its application to us so um, that's what Horton sees as the signs and seals of, of uh, God's uh, covenant uh, in regards to the sacrament. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the uh, the uh, beyond the sacraments, a true church um, must preach the word uh, faithfully, and um, we see again through through the uh, New Testament where the word is preached. We see in the book of Acts where Apollos, who didn't realize the fullness or, or all that Christ had accomplished, was uh, corrected so that he could speak more accurately in regards to, um, uh, to the word of God. So this, this faithful preaching, this faithful teaching of the word goes uh, right alongside with, um, as a true mark of the church, with the, the sacraments. And uh, the importance of teaching, again, comes based upon God's word, as the Apostle Paul encouraged uh, his young protege, Timothy, in regards uh, from 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, that it is the scriptures that are inspired and God breathed, and um, thus they are for reproof and correction and for training us uh, in all righteousness. Um, in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, we're reminded or told that the um, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able, able to pierce the very uh, inner parts of our being. And so to faithfully preach and teach 
um, are aspects that we, as uh, again the Apostle Paul pointed out in Colossians chapter one, um, that we're to admonish one another, we're to we're to teach one another, um, so that we can grow. And and the idea there in uh, in Colossians chapter one of this admonishing is uh, is for the purpose of correction, um, correcting our course. So as we as we a part of as a part of Scripture. Uh, in in the body in the church um, are growing to be conformed to the image of God's Son. Uh, we will need, we will require correction along the way, and and that's that idea of admonishing, and then teaching, so as to correct someone. Um, we want to point them in the right direction, but we want to also uh, use the Word of God to then enforce and encourage and and uh, allow someone to know. Uh, the proper way uh, to live in regards and in line with uh, God's word, and so it's important that the word be preached in a um, in a faithful manner. And um, as we know, it's it's the word of God that the Holy Spirit quickens uh, to our heart, not only in regards to initial salvation, but in this sanctification process or in this growth that we'll go through. Um, another aspect of the church or another uh, piece of the true church is church discipline. And uh, church discipline is vital um, because for us to admonish and teach one another, we must recognize that there will be um, there will be error, there will be sin, there will be transgression. And so we are to be a part of this body of the church in not only correcting and admonishing one another, but that's really the ultimate care for one another is is how we practice church discipline. You know, the book of Hebrews uh, talks about in chapter 11 that, that God disciplines his children because of his love for them. And uh, in the same way that I disciplined my children as they were growing up, my goal was so that they would not only be able to know and identify what was wrong but for the purpose of motivating them to change or directing them to change and i want to read specifically excuse me while i turn here to get my bible i want to read specifically from uh, matthew's gospel where this is instituted by christ so that we have an aspect and an understanding of this idea of church discipline in matthew <clears throat> excuse me uh, in Matthew chapter 18, I want to begin reading in verse uh, 15. And it, the Bible says, as, as recording the words of Christ, And if your brother sins, go and repro reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. That's the key statement right there. That's the key statement that you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, Take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. It's so important that we understand that last phrase there. And excuse me while I get a, a little drink of water. It's so important that we understand that last phrase there in verse 15, that if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. And if he listens to you, you have won your brother. The goal, if you hear nothing else that I say about church discipline, the goal is restoration. The goal is winning over our brother and sister in Christ. The goal is that we would be able to be used by God in the life of another to help them and to direct them in the sanctification or uh, the process that God is using to bring them to be more and more like Christ. I cannot emphasize this enough. That's the goal. Just as a loving parent, would discipline their child, as Hebrews 11, we mentioned that just a moment ago, 
as Hebrews 11 says, God disciplines us because he loves us. So just as a loving parent, the goal of discipline is always that idea of correction and to bring them back to the place to where they should be. So too in church discipline, I cannot emphasize this enough, that in church discipline, the goal is always restoration. Now, the process carries on that if you go to a brother or sister in Christ in private, um, the goal is to share with them, hey, um, I notice or I see or I'd like to ask you a question, how things go. You can approach it in a number of different ways. But remember in your approach even that the goal is restoration. So if you just go running up to someone and you're hammering them or you're just yelling at them, how do you think they're going to respond? Approach your brother or sister in Christ with the same kindness, compassion, um, and forgiveness that God has given us in Christ Jesus. That's Ephesians 4.32. That's how we're to treat one another. And so to deal with a brother or sister in Christ, um, your concern is motivated by your love for them that you don't want to see them stray. We need to encourage one another. Um, Hebrews 3.13 says we need to encourage one another um, as, as long as we can. Uh, but that needs to always be the idea. And part of that encouragement can be, hey, approaching someone with this idea that, that hey, I could see things are not going the way they, they are. Or maybe even just approach with the question of, hey, are things going the way they are? And then dealing with them one-on-one. -on -one. There's an incredible aspect in regards to any group of human beings that if you just dealt with someone one-on-one, -on -one, in regards to an issue or a problem or a wrong, no one else would have to know about it. And with no one else knowing about it, it seems practical to me that that would lead to an elimination of gossip. That would lead to um, an elimination of, of, of being cliquish and, and looking at people as an outcast. I, I just see so many benefits of if we truly understand that within the body of Christ, the goal is restoration and discipline. Now, the rest of the process does lay out that if dealing with someone one-on-one -on -one, uh, doesn't work, that you would find someone else who would be able to go with you and approach this person again. You only approach them with the goal being restoration. And uh, then if that doesn't happen, you know, you, you take it to the church and the church body. Um, deals with the situation. But just as God would lead us to repentance, I trust and hope that our goal would always be um, to lead someone else um, to repentance, that, that God would be able to use us in the life of someone else so that they would um, realize where they, were, where they are out of touch or out of step um, with the gospel and would repent and be forgiven, and once again live in that process of sanctification moving forward in their own personal life. Let me say it again. I cannot overemphasize that church discipline, the goal is always restoration, winning over a brother, as um, Christ has put it. Um, so, we see the preaching of the word and in, in the faithful preaching, the faithful and regular preaching of the word. We we talk about the carrying out uh, church discipline. And, and did I mention the goal is always restoration? Uh, just uh, making sure you get the point there. Um, a true church um, will also, again, in line with the New Testament, uh, will have people within the church. And as First Peter um, exhorts the, the elders or the leaders, um, that they are to be godly, they are to be Christ-like. And so um, let me encourage you to always uh, stay in a church where there is godly leadership. And if the leadership turns um, away from the Bible, away from the things of God, that you would um, understand and be led to um, to discern that. Uh, but But there's no church without the people, and the people within the church 
um, are godly leaders, um, New Testament leadership, um, elder or overseer at your church, more than likely it's, it's probably the word pastors. And uh, from the New Testament context, you can use the term pastor, elder, overseer um, interchangeably. Um, there are deacons, uh, which are those are servants um, or ministers uh, within the church. And just want to touch on these, not going to spend a lot of time on these, um, but just to give you uh, kind of New Testament uh, leadership that's set forth. But also there's this aspect of the priesthood of the believer, which is all those who are in Christ. Hebrews chapter 4 says, Christ is our high priest. And through him, we have direct access to the throne. And so each one of us has that position of not only being able to go directly to God, but also the responsibility that comes along with that. And so um, as such, being a part of the church, we are a community of the believers and we are to be involved um, as God would lead as those who are sharing in the sacraments, those who are sitting under the faithful preaching of God's word, those whose primary goal in regards to relationship with one another in the church is to uh, restore and um, help others in, in times of repentance in their own life. And as would be obvious from that, be open to that from others. And um, so th that's an important aspect because of each one of us having that, that um, direct access to God through his son, Jesus Christ. So I, I trust that this has been an encouragement to you. Hopefully it has encouraged you in regards to your involvement in, in a local church body. And I trust that God would use you in a special way within your church. God bless you. Look forward to being together. Uh, again at another time and also want to continue to encourage you to stay up with your reading and uh, in just a few weeks the course will be completed uh, just a reminder of your creed and uh, continue to work on that and uh, as always or hopefully always I've reminded you that uh, feel free to contact me uh, all my contact information is there on the syllabus and uh, if I can be of any help to you, I would be glad to. God bless.